All right, should we start? I think it's 4 10. Um, let's get going. So um, welcome everyone. So this is the Tracy and Roof Store Lectureship in the Life Sciences. It's the most prestigious of the endowed seminars at UC Davis. Um, Tracy Store was the founding chair of the Department of Zoology, while Roof Store was the only woman graduate in the university medical school class of 1913 and was the first woman pediatrician in Yolo County. So they are both trailblazers. The store endowment makes it possible to invite distinguished biological scientists to the UCD campus to present lectures and to discuss science with our faculty and our students. So today I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Sachin Panda as our first store lecturer of this academic year. Uh, Dr. Panda is a professor and the Rita Richard and Atkinson chair at the Salk Institute in La Jolla. He did his uh, PhD in the lab of Steve Kay at the Scripps Research Institute, where he studied mechanisms regulating plant circadian rhythms. He then went on to pursue his postdoctoral fellowship working with John Hoganesh at the Genomics Institute of the Novartis Research Foundation to study animal circadian timekeeping. Just like Tracy and Ruth Store, I think Dr. Panda has been a trailblazer throughout his career. His research in circadian genomics in insects, rodents, and primates have offered a blueprint for understanding molecular mechanisms of circadian clocks. Uh, furthermore, Dr. Panda is a pioneer in studying time-restricted eating, uh, and his research has shown that consistent meal times is critical um, <clears throat> to prevent or even reverse chronic diseases and perhaps to even increase lifespan. Um, in addition to being prolific in scientific publications, he has also been an author of two uh, general audience books to promote circadian wellness. So without further ado, um, let's welcome Dr. Panda. Thank you. It's a, it's a huge honor. Uh, to be here for many reasons. One is I actually started my scientific training back in India in Aggie School. So I was well aware of the um, premier research that goes on in UC Davis. And in fact, when I was back in India, one of my dreams was to become an agricultural scientist one day in the US and maybe USDA lab here. So <laughs> it was always in my dream. And another reason is actually after postdoc, when I was looking for a job, the first job offer actually came from UC Davis. Richard is here. He, he offered me the first job. And I had two or three choices and ended up at SOG. So I always have a very high regard and um, special place. UC Davis has a special place in my heart. And thank you, Joanna, for inviting. And thank you, Storo family, for making this happen because scientific communication to the general public uh, is very important. And particularly in the light of what we have been experiencing in the last two to three years, it has become more and more important. Okay, so I'd like to say that to live at our peak physical, intellectual, and emotional performance, irrespective of age, gender, ethnicity, or health status is a universal human right and the human aspiration. In fact, everything that we do in science, whether it's physical or biological science, it's all directly or indirectly geared towards this to enhance human performance and human living. 
And to be at peak performance might mean different things to different people. For example, when you're babies or when you're children, peak performance might mean to excel in sports or excel in whatever you are trying to do, whether it's studies or in playground. Whereas in mid-adulthood or young adults, uh, peak performance might mean to get the Olympic gold medal or be healthy and raise children. And in the middle is uh, peak performance might mean to be in your peak physical, emotional, and intellectual health so that you don't have to spend in your healthcare and save that money for your children to go to school, to college. And when we're in our older is peak performance might mean just to be able to dance in your daughter's wedding or to play with your grandchildren or to go around the world to enjoy the fruit of lifelong work. But the reality is we cannot actually, we are not living our life to its fullest extent. And the reason uh, mostly four different buckets of disease or disabilities that affect us infectious diseases, and we are all familiar with that. And in fact, this is what has been driving modern bio, bio, biomedical research because the germ theory of disease that started modern biological research essentially um, said that most of our diseases are due to germs that are external to our body. And finding out how it is different between our self and foreign body and kill the Infectious agent has been the driving force. In fact, that has had longer, most important impact on increase in human longevity because just 100 years ago, if a baby was born in this country, the life expectancy was only 45 years. And on an average, every year of biomedical research has lengthened human lifespan by three months so that now we are at a stage where when a baby is born now, he or she is most likely to live up to the age of 80 years of age. But still, we are battling infectious disease and almost everybody in this room might have taken a course of antibiotics or is expected to take a course of antibiotics in the next 10 years. Uh, second is metabolic and chronic disease, obesity, diabetes, and associated diseases affect a lot of us. Uh, brain health condition, depression, anxiety, and related disorders and then injuries, because although we don't pay attention, almost everybody in this room must have gone through at least one spell of injury. And in fact, by the age of 60, almost all of us would have at least one type of connective tissue injuries, which reduces our um, performance, particularly physical performance, which has a cascading effect. Event, effect. Uh, so, for example, in the U.S. alone, almost uh, half of adults have high blood pressure. Almost half of adults have pre-diabetes or diabetes. Um, three out of 10 adults will have liver disease in their lifetime. Four out of 10 will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Um, nearly half of us um, go through at least one spell of medically diagnosed depression or, or anxiety in our lifetime and half of us have digestive issues before the age, by the age we reach 60. And same thing goes for injuries and lung disease. Of course, this is data from a few years ago, but now we know that COVID, for example, which, is a, uh, which affects the lung, uh, will infect almost 60% of adults in this country and worldwide. So then the theme is almost all of us will go through not one or two, maybe multiple disease in our lifetime. So that means an ideal longevity plan should be powerful enough to prevent disease and to solve multiple health issues, accelerate cure, and also bring us back to full functionality. It's not that we just get cured, just like what we are experience, experiencing with COVID, although the virus is gone, we are not coming back to full functionality. And that's why we have this post COVID syndrome, which signifies the return to full functionality is also important. But the problem is we actually don't have a single pill that solves more than two disease or conditions. The best thing we have is Tylenol PM that will take care of your headache, and maybe your fever and you'll have a good night of sleep. But beyond that, now, we don't have many medications that actually cures two or more disease. 
And at the same time, if you look at the top 10 highest grossing drugs in the US, then for every person they help, they don't help three to 24 different people, um, people who are taking the drug. So that means the best efficacy of a drug is 25%. So that means there is a lot of headroom for figuring out who, how to improve the health and increase resilience. And this is where um, I would bring up the issue of circadian rhythms, which is the ultimate sign of vigor, vitality, and healthy aging. And I would actually take it to this extent that just like the germ theory of disease drove biomedical research for the last 100 years, maybe there can be circadian theory of health that optimum circadian rhythm alone or in combination with optimum nutrition or medication can increase, can prevent, cure, and reverse maybe many chronic diseases, increase health span, sustain resilience, against infectious disease and also lengthen the reproductive lifespan. Because so far in biomedical research, we haven't figured out how to extend reproductive lifespan. And in fact, although we always say caloric restriction increases longevity, it does not increase reproductive lifespan. It actually compromises it. So that's why we need better lifestyle for, um, for improving overall health. Okay, so circadian rhythms, when the term comes up, then we typically think about sleep. And um, we now know that it's much more than sleep, but actually sleep is a very strong biomarker of circadian rhythm. For example, those of you who were, who were lucky enough to go to bed around 10 o'clock at night, um, had their deepest sleep around two o'clock in the morning. And since clock helps us anticipate waking up around four o'clock in the morning, your body temperature began to rise, your heart rate began to increase, you might have breathed a little bit more so that after waking up, you don't feel that groggy or sleepy. And as soon as you wake up and go outside, get a good dose of light or melatonin level, the sleep hormone drops, the cortisol levels begins to rise, your bowel movement is most likely in the morning and your peak insulin sensitivity happens in the first half of the day. Our alertness is much better before noon and our muscle performance peaks around this time, late in the afternoon, um, there is less risk, risk for injury to um, muscle injury. And then in the evening, as the night rolls in, melatonin levels will begin to rise, usually two to three hours before habitual bedtime, your body will cool down and will go back to sleep. And then the question is, how does it relate to what we know about foundations of health? Because we know that the three foundations of health are sleep, meals or nutrition and physical activity. And in fact, studies over the last 20 or 30 years have shown that circadian clocks reciprocally regulate uh, sleep, nutrition or hunger satiety, and also physical activity when we are more physically active and what is the benefit of physical activity. All of these are reciprocally regulated by the circadian clock. And the circadian system as we all know it evolved within a rotating planet with one predictable constant that is the arrival of light and arrival of darkness. So that's why the whole system is also regulated by light and dark. So with this, then the question is, how do we use, what is the function of circadian rhythm in overall health? And many um, multiple lines of research, mostly omic studies and also physiological studies, cell-based studies, and all of them have, um, mostly shown four major outputs or functional physiological outputs, that is uh, circadian rhythms maintain optimum immune function because circadian rhythm disruption often lead to chronic inflammation or down-regulation of immune system. Uh, it also helps optimum repair, for example, recovery from injury, but also every day we injure a lot of our epithelial cells, almost seven to 10% of our gut epithelium is injured and those have to be replaced. And the clocks help us to uh, time it to the right time of the day so that we can repair them. And of course, optimum brain function because sleep uh, is intimately associated with optimum brain function and sleep is a strong output of circadian rhythm and optimum metabolism and detoxification actually helps us to maintain a uh, healthy level of metabolism and uh, detoxification so that we don't get um, DNA damage causing uh, chemicals accumulate in our system. 
so those are the broad overstroke of what uh, clocks actually do. Uh, but then the question is, um, what are how are these rhythms produced? Circadian rhythms are controlled by circadian clocks that are present in every organ. And this is, again, one breakthrough that happened almost 20, 22 years ago, uh, because before that, we always thought that clocks are present only in the brain and in certain type of cells, but um, some very accidental work in some, some labs actually led to the recognition that almost every cell in our body has its own clock. And in fact, the conventional wisdom right now is the brain clock, just like our brain clock, we have clocks in almost every organ, including even in our hair follicles. And the brain clocks directly or indirectly orchestrate rhythms in all these peripheral organs that lead to daily rhythms in physiology, metabolism, behavior, and even microbiome also has some daily diurnal rhythms and it's connected to the outside world through eyes. Now the question is on a very broad scale, what are the advantages of having clocks? And I would say these advantages can be broadly classified into these six different categories. One is anticipation. And this is something that we all connect to. So for example, every day when we schedule our day, we anticipate what is going to happen next so that we can be at the school at this right time and the office at the right time. So similarly, our body anticipates when it's going to be morning so that melatonin level begins to drop or cortisol levels begin to rise. So there is a huge component of anticipation. And in fact, it pervades every kingdom of life. So in, uh, and the, some of the um, thoughts is the life, of the higher life on this planet happened because the phytoplankton and the plants, because of the anticipation effect, they could harvest 10 to 15% extra carbon because the carbon fixing machinery is ready before the first ray of sun comes out so that uh, all phot photosynthetic animals or sorry, organisms can fix carbon. Then synchronization and separation are very basic fundamental principles of time management. We all do this in everyday life. We make shopping list and go buy everything together. So that is synchronization. And also we separate shopping from school. So similarly our body, oxidative and reductive processes are temporally separated. So in that way, there is not much conflict. And it's very important, for example, in plant science, when nitrogen fixation has to happen in a reductive environment, and that's a nice example of how oxidative and reductive um, processes in a cell can should be temporally separated. And then gating, we experience that. So for example, during daytime, our sensory uh, system is gated very differently so that a uh, small amount of noise can, uh, we can pay attention. Whereas in nighttime, sensory gating is in a very different state so that our arousal threshold goes up so we don't get out of sleep. So similarly, on biochemical level and gene expression level, we also see that gating. And then I won't go into receptor sensitivity and homeostasis, but the bottom line is almost everything that we connect with homeostasis or constant level is actually not homeostatic. It's a dynamic homeostatic it's homeostasis. For example, our body temperature has to cycle 0.5 degree or so every day. Our blood pressure has to cycle. If it doesn't cycle, then that's not a good sign of a cardiovascular health. Similarly, almost all hormones uh, do cycle. And uh, that brings us to this very fundamental idea that is evolving, that is almost every hormone, every neurotransmitter, enzymes, and even the product of every gene, whether it's mRNA protein, phosphoprotein, or different protein modification, they all rise and fall at a certain time of the day or night. And this is something that I started being curious when I was a postdoc, and in fact, Stacy Harmer, who is a faculty here, see, first did this experiment in Arabidopsis, sampling Arabidopsis seedlings in every couple of hours and trying to figure out which genes are circadianly regulated. And I've been doing it many times, but at the same time, I had this in the back of my mind, we can never do these experiments in humans where we cannot sample, say human liver, kidney, or uh, any multiple organs or brain regions in every couple of hours and see what is cycling. So the closest we can do is to go back to non-human primates. So a few years ago, almost uh, um, four years ago, we published this, but actually the experiment was done in 2013 and it took us five years to plan this experiment. 
we went to Institute of Primate Research in Kenya, where we um, collected tissue samples from 12 uh, adult baboons, male baboons, uh, who were captured and quarantined for 18 months at International Primate Research Center. And we collected 64 different tissue, uh, tissue types, including 22 different brain regions in every two hours. And we did RNA-seq analysis. And then for every brain or peripheral organ, we asked a very simple question, how many of those transcripts that we're seeing fit a sinusoidal or cosine curves with periodicity of 24 hours? And what we found was this is the phase plot um, of all the 64 tissues. The bottom line is, for example, here, if we see uh, abdominal muscle, then there are nearly um, 200 or so uh, genes that cycle and reach their peak expression level a couple of hours before the baboon wakes up. And then around 100 uh, genes that uh, cycle and reach their peak expression level in late afternoon before uh, it's getting ready to go back to sleep. And that's in the gluteal muscle. And similarly, almost every tissue that we, that we looked at had clocks. And in fact, if we combine all this data and ask, is there a pattern to it? What we found was in middle of the day, nearly 12,000, 11,200 genes cycle and reach their peak expression level, whereas in the middle of the night, only 700 genes rise and reach their peak expression level. And this experiment was actually done in baboons who um, almost all vivarium, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, vivarium uh, um, primates are kept. They usually get two to three meals within eight to 10 hours interval. Uh, so those are the two meals these baboons are given. This is the core body, sorry, the skin temperature and the back of the um, brown fat uh, that cycles very nicely. This is the cortisol level and that's the activity sleep pattern, which is very similar to diurnal humans. Um, so this has become a very nice data set for a lot of people to mine this data and then figure out what is cycling. And if we do functional, sorry, if we do functional annotation of this data set, then what we find is almost every basic cellular processes are circadianly regulated or shows a diurnal rhythm in at least 20 out of those 64 different tissue types that we harvested. And if we look at any human disease that relates to any one of these basic cellular processes. And the other thing that came out of the study was also nearly 85% of FDA approved drug targets or the supplements that we take, the targets have a circadian rhythm or the, or the uh, channels that absorb and detoxify, they might have a circadian rhythm. So that will eventually translate to there might be optimum time for any medication to work and also there may be optimum time when the medication is taken, there, there might be less adverse side effect. And one thing that is that we that the field is increasingly recognizing is almost all blood pressure lowering medications taken at bedtime may be better in terms of reducing uh, long-term risks for cardiovascular event than the same medication, same dosing taken in the morning. In fact, many, many uh, new drugs for diabetes, for example, SGLT2 inhibitor, although there are many trials, there was actually one trial with two different doses, morning versus evening. The low dose morning SGLT2 inhibitor was actually very different, had very different efficacy than the night. And the night SGLT2 inhibitor uh, low dose was uh, slightly more beneficial, but anyways, you don't want to give a CLT2 inhibitor in the night. People think that you have to wake up too many times to pee. Uh, but the bottom line is this is another growing us area of circadian rhythm. Then the question is, okay, so how are the circadian clocks connected to the outside world? So this is when um, I was doing my postdoc, we um, figured out because for almost 75 years, starting from 1920s onwards, people knew that many blind mice and blind people, many, not all, who have lost rod and cone visual function, although they cannot see the world, they can sense the world. And they can reset their clock when they go from one time zone to another time zone. So that means there must be light receptor other than rod and cones, and that's the time we um, we and two other independent labs simultaneously discovered that there is this melanopsin expressing blue light photoreceptors that are present in human and mouse eyes. And again, this is an example of how basic science research in 
organisms like frog and scientists trying to figure out how frogs adapt to light led to the discovery but because melanopsin simply means these are the opsin like molecules present in frog melanosomes or skin pigment uh, pigment producing cells in this skin and the same gene same gene product actually mrna and protein was discovered was detected in nearly 5000 neurons of the human eye and nearly 2000 ganglion cells in the mouse eye and these are the mouse uh, melanopsin ganglion cells and in the next few years we characterized and what we found was this melanopsin is most sensitive to blue light in fact daylight is the richest source of blue light and candlelight and moonlight are not that strong source and uh, it so that our ancestors when they had very little access to light bright light in the evening there was not much activation of melanopsin so it allowed our ancestors to increase sleep hormone melatonin levels to rise at night which resulted in better sleep at night. And melanopsin also needs a stronger dose of light to be activated. So when our ancestors went outdoor for hunting or agriculture, then they were exposed to bright light, which synchronized their brain clock, raised alertness, reduced depression, and they were relatively happier. Uh, whereas in modern days, we spend almost 24 hours, actually 92% of our time based on cell phone tracking data, we spend 92% of our time indoor, inside a human built environment, and only 8% outdoor. And out of that 8%, some time is actually at night. So we spend very little time outdoor. And in the night, we are exposed to bright screens and bright light, which activates melanopsin, disrupts circadian rhythm, reduces sleep hormone melatonin, and we have poor sleep. And daytime, we are stuck in dimly lit room like this, and uh, which misaligns our circadian rhythm and reduces alertness and we might have foggy brain, we may not think clearly. So the insomnia uh, at night and foggy brain during daytime, if it continues for several weeks, some months, then we may be prone to more irritation uh, to all the way to bipolar panic and, and uh, those kind of um, disease or dis uh, conditions, for example, nearly one third of people who are in ICU, they develop delirium. And that is mostly ascribed to constant environment in the ICU, almost constant light and constant poking. So uh, this is one example where even if you put mice under constant light, we see many uh, psychiatric issues within few few weeks. So that's why there is this new idea, the discovery of melanopsin, and the idea, the quality of light has a huge impact on our neuroendocrine system, for example, melatonin, and our brain function has a big impact on the lighting industry. If we think about lighting industry, over the last 200 years, we lighted our house just for safety. We never thought about health. For the first time, lighting is considered in the context of health. And lighting is a $27 billion industry. And so that's why what we hope is in the near future, we'll see many breakthroughs and many commercialization of lighting. And this is really uh, typified in, in this article from The Economist who um, almost prophetically <laughs> seven, eight years ago, came up with this idea, the light therapeutics. And in fact, nowadays you will see many advertisements for bright light therapy. And also when you go to your optometrist, you may be asked to put a blue filtering coating. Of course, there is not much research in that area, but what is known is in certain cases of migraine, childhood migraine pain, children who wear a blue filtering eyeglass, which looks like orange or pink, uh, they actually reduce, they experience reduced number of episodes of migraine and also reduced severity of migraine. So this is one example where lighting might have one impact, but I'll get to another much better example um, in a few, few minutes. Then the question for everybody is, how much lighting is good for me? Because we just cannot go around having a light meter. We, actually, scientists are still arguing what kind of light meter we should be using and how much light should be there and best light meters will cost you $10,000. So we can have some rule of thumb. 
So for example, lighting to, de uh, to treat depression or to reduce seasonal affective disorders, or maybe I would take it to one further step, postpartum depression, because after childbirth, many moms are stuck indoor. Uh, they're sleepless at night and they're trying to catch up with light during, uh, with uh, sleep during daytime. So the idea is 10,000 locks of light for up to an hour may be good for you if you're experiencing depressive symptom. What is 10,000 locks of light? If it is cloudy day in, you see in Davis, then outside it's around five to 10,000 locks. And if you go outside uh, to that, um, uh, to that area next to the glass wall, then that's around 1,000 lux. So the idea is if you have breakfast or lunch next to a large window, that may be good for us, for most of us. But if those of us were experiencing depression, it may be good to take a uh, walk outdoor. You don't have to be under the sun. And at night, less than 20 lux for two hours before bedtime. Again, what is 20 lux? If you have a 40-watt bulb, which is orange sifted, uh, in your bedroom. So that's roughly 20 lux of light if you are three to four feet away from the light source. And so as a result, if you have to work, it's better to use spotlight or light layering. This is a new concept in architecture that um, a lot of people are following. And of course, you got to dim down your lighting and also avoid to go to grocery stores and drug stores because bright light can keep their cashiers awake and the pharmacist makes less mistake. So that's why all the pharmacies and all the grocery stores are now having 1400 locks of light. If you want to know what is 1400 locks of light, go to a Walmart and that's 14 to 1500 locks of light. Um, for almost two years, I went around with a light meter in my hand like a mad scientist and I was recording light so I know all these numbers. Here is a clear example of how lighting can be used in a very productive way. Every year in the US, there are 3.6 million babies are born, out of which 90,000 babies are premature babies who, want, who need to be admitted to an ICU, neonatal ICU. And in neonatal ICUs, most babies are put in continuous light. Uh, but this is a very simple experiment done in Mexico City where uh, this physician, he came up with this idea to cover the babies with kind of a helmet-like device. It's not like choking the baby, but they still have at the light level at the eye level for these preemies were still 20 lux. And it was done for 12 hours of light like this and 12 hours of this um, head was covered. It's a randomized controlled trial on 60 babies. You cannot do too many um, randomized controlled trial on NICUs. And the outcome was impressive. So on an average, these babies were released from hospital 13 days earlier because they gained their weight and became mature, release ready that quickly. Now think about it. One day of NICU stay in the US cost $15,000. And when 90,000 babies are put in NICU, one day of releasing them early will amount to $1.4 billion just for one day. And if we have light dark cycle in all the NICUs and if we reduce hospital stay by 10 days, that's 13 to $14 billion in saving just by covering their um, head with blanket. No other drug, no other medical device till now can increase, accelerate that NICU hospital stay that much. So this is the power of using light to the best extent. Then imagine there are all these ICUs who are also constantly lit and those patients are also constantly fed. And one day of ICU uh, for an adult is somewhere between $17,000 to $20,000 in the US. And if you think about it, there are nearly 150,000 hospital ICU beds in the US and 70 to 80% occupancy all the time. So you can think of a huge amount of hospital uh, bill saving. And in fact, in the US right now, the hospital medical spending is around $1.3 trillion. So even if we make a small dent, that's a good amount of saving. So that brings to another point that we, I told you that light is the biggest source, best and trainer of circadian rhythm. But many years ago, almost in 2000, um, Uli Sibler um, discovered that when mice are fed at the wrong time, then the circadian clock follows in the liver 
follows the food timing. And then we did a, a similar experiment. We wanted to know if some genes in the liver follow food and some genes are following the brain, that that can cause um, conflict. So we did a very systematic study. What we found was um, most of the peripheral clocks, all of these peripheral clocks, they actually take cues from when we eat or when the animals eat. So then it was kind of an aha moment because we know that it's really difficult to control lighting in modern societies because we cannot impose rules that everybody should switch off that light or even it's impractical. It means you try to switch off all your light and try to live with candlelight for one week. Actually, there was a a reporter from San Diego Union Tribune, a local newspaper who tried that and she came back and said, no, there's no way you can control light. But if we can control food, then that will be really amazing. And what is interesting is just like, think about your best friend. If your best friend knocks on your door every night at one o'clock in the morning, then he will not be your best friend anymore. <laughs> so similarly, healthy food at the wrong time is junk. And this is something that people have to understand because when we ask people, what time do you eat? Many people would say, well, I have just a piece of fruit before going to bed. Or when I wake up in the middle of the night, I have a bowl of cereal, healthy cereal or milk. Actually, all of that is not good for circadian rhythm. Then when we think of circadian rhythm disruption or people who are experiencing circadian rhythm disruption, we always connect Pilots, doctors, shift workers, they are the ones who are experiencing circadian rhythm disruption. But in fact, if we think about it, our ancestors had a very different kind of circadian rhythm because they were exposed to natural light throughout the day. And then at nighttime, some, sorry, this is flipped somehow. <laughs> the, I always put night on the left side. And uh, during, uh, yeah. Uh, so during daytime, they had a lot of physical activity. Nighttime, they had a lot of sleep. And the opportunity to eat was limited because food was scarce. People mostly ate two or three meals. And after industrialization, our modern rhythms are very different. We are uh, spending much of time in dimly lit room. Our sleep is reduced. Our opportunity to physical activity is very low. In fact, we have some objective data to support that. And our opportunity to eat has increased because our nutritionists have been telling us that you have to eat in every two to three hours, otherwise your brain will not function. Your brain needs glucose, simple glucose, you have to have. And then people who are in exercise physiology, particularly the bodybuilders, I don't know why, <laughs> they think that they have to eat in every two to three hours to keep the mTOR activity high so that they can build muscles. And if you talk to them, all of them have digestive issues. Uh, so. Uh, the bottom line is our circadian rhythms are really disrupted and almost a vast proportion of us have that. The question is, how do we know this? So in collaboration with Horacio de Iglesia from UW, who has been going around and putting activity watches on um, ancestral people who have no or limited access to electricity. So he put this active watches for 45 days and that measures light and physical activity so that we can figure out what time they go to sleep or wake up. So this is the average time when this person saw five blocks of light. So five blocks of light is the amount of light under those chairs that where you are sitting. That's very dim light. And then this is the first time and last time when this person sees 50 blocks of light, which is an average light level in this room. So when this person, the toba gets out of the bed and opening the door, that's the amount of light they see. And this is the 500 lux of light when the person is actually getting out to the open. And this is the last time they see. So say all the bright light exposure is happening during daytime. And that's the time when he goes to bed around 9.30 to 10 and wakes up. And this is 45 days of data. And what you're saying is standard deviation, not standard error of mean over 45 days. And when Horatio puts the same watches on Seattle high school students, this is what we see. The bright light in one student goes till there and then you know, the sleep time is never before midnight and they're waking up just before the school start time. And the same thing, if we do the study in UCSD uh, students, then out of 100 students, we found only one student who went to bed before midnight for two days and we collected data for three weeks for each student. So out of, just imagine 300, um, sorry, uh, 
<laughs> I just lose track, but less than uh, one percent of the nights they were the entire population was sleeping before um, midnight. So this is another example where Horacio was brave enough to go to this uh, Seattle school board and convince that they should try delaying school start time by one hour in two different schools. One was a rich neighborhood school, one was a poor neighborhood school. Uh, and uh, these two schools delayed the high school start time by one hour and they collected their activities, sleep and uh, also tardiness and grades from these schools. And what he found was delaying school start time increased their sleep duration by 34 minutes. And typically we parents think that if students are sleeping more, they're going to do bad in the exam, but actually their grades improved by 4.5% and the tardiness went down. What else will cause this kind of sleep improvement? If you put all the Seattle high school students, 53,000 of them, if you just take the Seattle high school district, and put them on sleep medication, sleeping pill for a year, then you'd increase the average sleep time by 18 minutes. That's the population average. So it was way much better than giving all the students sleeping pill. Of course, no parent would give sleeping pill for a year because we know the bad adverse effect. So that led to, that is one of the studies. And then this study has been repeated in Europe, many places, and also in the US that led to California um, having the delayed school start time. Of course, uh, Jerry Brown was not convinced, so he vetoed the bill and then uh, Gavin Newsom actually passed it. Okay, so we got two examples where we have clear population. One was intervention in hospital and second one was public policy change that leads, that is based on circadian rhythm science and is leading to a better outcome. So now the thing is, we know that at their, so the circadian rhythm field has been uh, figuring out if we, if we have broken circadian rhythm or habits, then what happens? And since shift workers are there for, since industrialization started, so we have those group of people, then we also have people who come to clinic and we disrupt their sleep or disrupt their circadian rhythm only for five to seven days and then we measure what happens. And of course, we have preclinical animal models where we can disrupt genetically or disrupt them by subjecting them to shift work like paradigm. So all of these um, are saying, yes, circadian rhythm disruption is bad, but in humans, for example, if we think what is shift work? Is it night shift work? Is it evening work? According to international labor organizations, staying awake for more than two hours and engaging in some task between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. You just cannot stay awake in your bed. You have to be working, you have to be studying or taking care of something, somebody, for 50 nights in a year or on an average once every week. Because when we disrupt our rhythm by at least two hours, then it takes two days for our clock to catch on. So that's why when we disrupt our sleep by two hours, we are actually suffering for three days out of a seven day week. And that led to ILO to define shift work like this. And now you can think that almost all of us are shift workers. And social jet lag again, in the weekend, if you are hanging out with your friends for drinks and then going to bed two hours later than your usual work time, sleep time. Uh, those of you who are frequent flyer milers, one, one million milers in United or whatever medallion in American Express, you're all ship workers because if you're flying at least 25 times in a year, that's 50 times is your flying days. And then those days we are essentially either jet lagged in a different time zone, or even if you are waking up early to go travel, catch up the flight, the, catch the flight, then that's also. And secondhand shift worker, we actually don't acknowledge them, but almost every firefighter, every doctor, every healthcare worker spouse or drug driver spouse experiences this because they want to be super nice. They want to stay awake to give companies to the shift worker spouses. So in a way, our whole world is running on shift work and circadian rhythm research has shown that chronic, just few days of losing sleep is not that bad. You will get mood swing. You may feel irritable, excessive daytime sleepiness. All of these things can happen. But if it continues for weeks, months, or years, then the risk for many of these diseases actually go up. 
It not only affects babies and children, it can also affect teenagers, young adults. And in, as we get older and older, more and more, more severe diseases, that risk can go up. We are not saying that just circadian rhythm disruption will cause this disease, just like P53 mutation can cause cancer, but the risk goes up. And, you know, for example, smoking increases risk for lung cancer. And after so many years of cancer research, we cannot actually cure lung cancer. But what we have been very successful in is reduce that risk by public policies to reduce smoking. So similarly, can we come up with better policies, just like the school start time, different ways to reduce the risk? And those in red affect more than 10% of the adult population, the yellow affect 5% of the adult population. And as a field, circadian rhythm field, we take three different approaches, training the clock, behavioral changes to improve our circadian rhythm, clocking the drugs, timing of the drug, hopefully that will pan out at least for a few diseases. It has been successful in some cases of cancer and blood pressure regulation and arthritis pain medication. And drugging the clock, can we develop molecules that change the function of the clock, particularly in older individuals or in certain disease, and those seem to be very effective as well. Okay, so then I'll come to another approach because we can change lighting, we can delay school start time, and can we use timing of food? And um, now the time restricting, which the first paper was published 10 years ago in 2012, and now it is kind of mixed up and is popularly known as intermittent fasting. The concept, for, for everybody is very simple. So for example, every time we eat, most of our food actually has a good amount of carb. And as soon as we eat, we usually use that readily available carb and then we store some of the carb as fat and then we also store fat. And as we eat breakfast, lunch and dinner, we continue to do that. And then after a few hours of last meal, uh, a mouse would start to burn some fat because the mouse will run out of car. And this is ex exaggerated and we humans take very long time. And the, uh, so the burning fat will actually happen after several hours of fasting. Although it takes many hours to do the fuel switching within 15 to 30 minutes of eating our first breakfast and the uh, switch actually flips. And when we burn fat, the ketone body and many other metabolites actually help interact with the circadian system to, um, to maintain a robust clock. And now imagine if we now spread this food and uh, over a long period of time, then we don't have that long-term overnight fasting. So as a result, many of the molecules that we produce during fasting are dampened. And, and also we may not be burning fat. This is a very simple idea. As a result, if you eat within 10 hours, maybe you'll be burning more fat. If you eat within 15 hours, you may not. To test that, we took identical set of mice and fed them the same number of calories from identical source of food. So quality and quantity of diet was well controlled. And we fed the first group random eating and then the second group was time restricted fed for 18 weeks. That was the difference in body weight. Nearly these mice were 21% uh, less weighing less. And those mice have all these chronic disease that are modeled typically in this high diet induced obesity model. And these mice consuming the same number of calories from the same unhealthy food were healthy. And the second set of experiment, we pattern off these mice and then put them in time restricted feeding and they switch back to um, healthier. And over the last 10 years, there are many labs who have done these experiments in flies and mice. And essentially what we find is since time-restricted feeding also improves circadian rhythm, also improves nutrient signaling. Um, so it's very hard to disentangle these two. It's a very nice way to bring nutrition science, physiology, and metabolism, which is very rich with circadian rhythm to understand how they interact to, um, to prevent or reverse some of these chronic disease. And then the challenge is how do we go from here to humans? So the first thing that we did was when people eat, well, a few years ago, we actually didn't have any idea how to collect that information. So we made an app called My Circadian Clock. And what we asked people is in the first experiment, we asked, we brought 156 people who are not shift workers, not um, students, and they were not uh, employees of SALK, UCSD, or Scripps because they were aware of our mouse studies. 
they had to take a picture of the food that they ate and press save. And then the food picture came to our server and looking at the food picture, we could say whether it had any calories or no calories. So for example, we excluded Diet Coke or black coffee, uh, ginger tea, if it looked very clear in that way, you may be excluding some calorie containing food. And we collected this for three weeks. So every has mark is one calorie containing food, the weekday and weekend feeding pattern is like this. And if we combine that, over three weeks, people actually eat quite a number of snacks, meals, and every time they drank something, everything was included. And this is the eating pattern of a person that's uh, morning 6 a.m., evening 6 p.m., noon and midnight. This person was not an outlier because for 156 people, we saw very similar pattern. In fact, if we ask um, the number of events peaked around noon and dinner time, and if we guesstimated how many calories are in each picture, then there was slightly more during lunch and dinner time. Um, for lunch and dinner, there may be multiple pictures because they would start the meal and then um, eat something new. But the midnight snacks are actually loaded with calories. So it's not that people are waking up to have one bite of a cookie and they go back. They actually eat a big bowl of ice cream. And if we ask, what is the circadian system expecting? When the circadian system expects food, so if we take 50% of, sorry, 95% of all feeding event and in what window that will happen, then what we found is 50% of adults eat for 14 hours, 45 minutes or longer. Only 10% of adults eat for less than 12 hours consistently every day. So that means nearly 90% of people, we kind of have a random eating pattern. So then the question is, how do we combine all of this? Everything that we have talked about, sleep, light, food, together to see what would be an ideal circadian day. And what we think is, there are at least six things. One, try to go to bed at a consistent time every night and, sorry, and be in bed for eight hours because most sleep scientists agree that being in bed for eight hours will give you seven hours of restorative sleep for your brain health. Then second, after waking up, try to avoid for at least for one or two hours. And this is something that um, we extrapolated, not that we see this absolutely. And this is, Mark, this is, this is really a big question for us because we know that melatonin inhibits glucose stimulated insulin release. And since it takes one to two hours after waking up for a melatonin to go to baseline, and that's the time when cortisol spikes, we suspect that waiting for an hour is good for us. And then second, and then the third is pick your breakfast time, try to be consistent because as breakfast time change can disrupt your circadian rhythm, it's better to stay within an hour window breakfast time and then eat all your food within eight, nine, 10, maximum 12 hours, not beyond that, because if we go beyond 12 hours, then your last meal may be two to three hours before bedtime. That's when your melatonin level is increasing and it cannot give you good glucose regulation. And also I've heard bright light. So that's um, number four. And of course, we know that physical activity is good. So having 30 minutes of physical activity and 30 minutes of daytime, daylight is pretty good for all of us. So this is our ideal circadian day. And then we asked, can people try to eat within eight hours? So this was the first study done seven years ago, and this was just a feasibility study. So that's why we asked 10 people to try to eat within 10 hours. So that's the, that's the baseline eating window, which was more than 14 hours. And they tried to eat the self-selected 10 hours window. And two of our participants relocated to East Coast, so we lost them. And what was interesting was within 16 weeks, they lost a modest amount of body weight. These were not overweight or obese people. They, these were overweight people, BMI 27. And we had no contact with them for up to a year. But when they came back, we were surprised to see that they maintained their body weight loss. And when we asked why, we were surprised to see that they actually said they felt more energetic in the morning and they slept better means in a day, every day when we wake up, what defines our day is whether we feel well-rested and whether we are feeling energetic to start the day. And this is some indirect benefit. And then, of course, other people have replicated similar kind of study. Uh, one thing is when people reduce their eating window, they inadvertently reduce their caloric intake. But um, Courtney Peterson did a very nice study where she maintained body weight and then found many of the benefits that are also found in 
um, mice. And then we wanted to see whether people with metabolic syndrome, um, actually this uh, slide is a little bit screwed up, but um, metabolic syndrome is people who have at least three of these five different components of metabolic dysregulation. And in the US, uh, the uh, prevalence of metabolic syndrome is pretty high. One in three ultimately will get metabolic syndrome and it increases with as, um, sorry. And in the second uh, study that was published a couple of years ago, we took 19 metabolic syndrome patients and 16 of them were on different kinds of medication. And we asked, can you combine this medication with time restricting? Of course, none of them had actually type two diagnosed type two diabetes or type one diabetes, but they had the other stuff and they were either on, um, most of them are actually on um, statins or blood pressure lowering drug and then few of them had other drugs. And it was a 12 week study. We put a continuous glucose monitor. We give them the app to log whatever they are eating. And uh, then through the app, they also get coaching how to do it. And what we found was <laughs> the baseline eating window was 15 hours. They reduced it to 10.8 hours. <laughs> so the change, they actually reduced their eating window by four and a half hours. And what, when you look at their eating pattern before and after, what we find is people delay their breakfast time by a couple of hours and they advance their dinner time or they stop eating after dinner snacks. And this is the eating pattern of uh, all those 19 people before is in orange and after at the end of the study was in blue. And uh, so that's what is uh, shown here. They delayed their breakfast and advanced their dinner. And what we found is after 12 weeks, the systolic blood pressure dropped, the diastolic also dropped. This is very hard to achieve with, it, with medication. Usually, most people don't respond to decrease in diastolic blood pressure. They respond to systolic, but time to eating helps with that. West circumference also reduced. The HDL cholesterol does not increase within 12 weeks. Hopefully, maybe it will take a long time. And uh, so that's the total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol that uh, decreases. And uh, in this study, people actually lost a little bit of weight. The BMI also reduced a little bit. But at the same time, this was not a randomized control trial, which is kind of the gold standard of clinical trial. So that's why we are repeating that study again in a randomized control trial. This is an example of somebody who was undiagnosed type two diabetic who was in our study. And the orange is the continuous glucose monitor glucose pattern in this person in the first 12, uh, sorry, 14 days. And if we look at the eating pattern, it was not bad. It means most people will say that you should eat three meals and your last meal should be early before say seven o'clock. The person is actually eating last meal before 7 p.m. But as soon as he wakes up, he eats his breakfast. He used to eat his breakfast because he had a long commute, he would come to work um, and then work, have a lunch. And we just asked him to delay that breakfast. So he would bring that breakfast to work and eat there. And that's the only change that he did. And after 12 weeks, his blood, blood sugar was almost normal. His HbA1c actually came down to 5.6 or something. Okay, so in the very last part, I would say that we have to address one major issue that is nearly one in four working adults works as a shift worker. In fact, your entire day is not possible without a shift worker. Every morning as you get out of your house, if you are still getting a newspaper, that newspaper was dropped by somebody who woke up before you did. This is the guy who is coming to pick up your trust woke up early. And the guy who is making your coffee and baking your morning breakfast, everybody, until the night. And in the middle of the night, if there is a medical emergency, 86% of calls that firefighters get are medical emergency. All of these, our entire society runs on shift workers. They're really, truly the, health, the heroes. Shift work disrupts circadian rhythm, increases risk for all these diseases. And shift workers are excluded from clinical trials. So we actually, they bear a disproportionately large burden of disease, but we don't include them in interventions that improves health. And also shift workers, if they take blood glucose lowering medication or blood pressure lowering medication, the shift work interferes with that efficacy of the drug. So they don't get as much benefit as we do. 
And guess what? Out of 420,000, 429,000 actually this morning, <laughs> clinical trials in clinicaltrial.gov in 221 countries, less than 400.1% studies around shift workers. And out of those 300, out of those 400, 350 are to study what is wrong with shift workers, less than 50 are to improve the health of shift workers. So that's why a few years ago, we partnered with, okay, so the audio is not coming, I'll figure out. Um, let's see. No, okay, no luck. <laughs> So almost five, four years ago, we got a grant from FEMA, Federal Emergency Medical, uh, sorry, Management Agency to study firefighters because firefighters do 24 hour shift work and they have 45% of death on work for firefighters is from cardiovascular disease. And uh, the goal was twofold. One, can they do 10 hour time restricting uh, while they're doing their job. And second, if they do, then what happens? What do they, will they get any benefits? So that was the study. And um, unfortunately, and during that study, what happened was we had a soft videographer who actually went with shift workers uh, without our knowledge, means it had to be separated and he followed them for during the study. And then at the end, we compiled that into a, um, documentary, which uh, hopefully will come out sometime, but this was the trailer, which <laughs> did not have the audio. Um, sorry. Okay, you can try. This is the last one. So, yeah, let's pause. Okay, that's okay. Well, that's okay. You tried. <laughs> okay, so um, I guess that was my last slide. Must be. So with that, I guess I'll end with this. Uh... No, nothing comes. <laughs> Anyways, the last one, just acknowledgement and other stuff. Um, so the bottom line is, the three foundations of health that we know, uh, sleep, nutrition, and physical activity, are really foundation of health. But at the same time, when you think of lifestyle, lifestyle is what when and how much we eat, sleep, and move on a daily basis. And what you're finding is what and how much is very difficult to control. In fact, I would challenge that no one in this room can accurately tell to 10% error how many calories you have eaten since morning, unless you have done only water fasting since morning. <laughs> so if we all PSDs cannot calculate how much calories we have eaten and we cannot figure out what are the proportion of macronutrient in our food, then how do we expect everybody to do that? But what you're finding is when we change timing, then everything else falls into place because when people go through 14 hours of fast and eat their breakfast at home, they improve nutrition quality. This is from one study that we finished in Europe that's uh, published. For firefighters, when they finish the dinner early, then they reduce their alcohol intake because firefighters are so much under many psychological distress that drinking is a big issue. In fact, the fire department is always trying to reduce alcohol intake. And we do see that in firefighters and also in other studies. We also see inadvertently people improve their sleep. And this is something that we're pursuing. So that means timing, uh, modifying the timing of food may be the first healthy habit people should try to incorporate and that way they can improve resilience and increase their healthy lifespan. Thank you so much. Right. Well, now you could get it back. 
All right. I think um, let's, we're kind of running long, but let's take one question uh, from the audience here. Does anybody have a question for Sachin? Uh, in the morning or during the day, it's good. Um, I'm off now for a few hours, but I always wear sunglasses. What's the impact on sunglasses? Yeah, so sunglasses um, depends on uh, what is the optical density. Many sunglasses go from 0.5 to 3. So if you're wearing a sunglass with optical density 3, so that means you are reducing light by 3 log units. In Davis, in the middle of summer, if it is a sunny day, then you are getting 250,000 locks of light. And of course, you have to wear sunglasses, otherwise you can burn, damage your retina. Um, but if you wear a moderate um, optical density sunglass, that should be good enough. Uh, the funny thing was, I was wearing sunglasses a lot of time, and then I wore one of those light sensing watches. And what I realized that in San Diego, the only time when I was getting bright light was when I was driving from home to work and work to home. Or at Salk, my office is in the basement downstairs. When I was going to the cafeteria and coming back, and then I stopped wearing sunglasses because inside the car, you get 5,000 to 8,000 locks of light, which is already filtered from UV. So then I stopped wearing sunglasses because most of us wear sunglasses in bright sun to avoid UV and also brightness. Hi, Richard. Um, oh, use of melatonin. Yes, that was a New England Journal of Medicine, big issue. Um, melatonin is unregulated in the US, but in European countries and also in uh, Canada, it's regulated. Um, few years ago, there are many, there are at least two uh, GWA studies that showed that type 2 diabetes and also obesity, I guess, um, one of the genes that are linked, one of the polymorphisms linked was melatonin receptor 1A, I guess. Um, and that led to the curiosity why melatonin. And then people found that melatonin receptor is present in the pancreas and uh, glucose induced insulin release may be dampened in people who have this. Mutation. In fact, 45% of adults in the US have this carrier. So that raises one interesting question. When we go to bed, our melatonin level begins to rise two hours before we go to bed. And when you, these days, a lot of people are taking melatonin supplement. And what is interesting is um, I used to buy melatonin supplement when I used to travel to India just to adjust. And those days it was very difficult to find a five milligram melatonin. It was one milligram and three milligram. Now it will be hard to find a three milligram melatonin because it's five, 10 or 15 milligram. And also there are melatonin that are slow release and slow degradation. So that means uh, 10 years ago, the melatonin that I was consuming, one milligram would 90% of it would be cleared within 20 minutes of taking that pill. But now this melatonin stays in your system. And in fact, if you're taking melatonin very close to your bed uh, dinner time, then you may be inhibiting glucose induced insulin release. And that's already shown in a couple of labs. In the morning, there are now studies showing that those who are taking heavy dose of melatonin, five to 10 milligram of melatonin, in the morning, they might have still high level of melatonin at breakfast time. And that might complicate the glucose regulation. There are studies showing melatonin, in fact, very good studies showing melatonin reduces the risk for breast cancer. And those studies used five milligram melatonin. So that's why that led to marketing of five milligram. And then the spouses of these um, participants who were in the breast cancer study, they started taking five to 10 milligram melatonin because um, there was this idea that you can reduce the risk for prostate cancer. So as a result, we are now in the US where five to 10 milligram mel melatonin has become the norm. And also the pediatric, uh, what is really uh, worrisome is the kids are now getting three to five milligram melatonin. So I guess the American Medical Association should come up with a statement. Melatonin cell went from $20 million a year 10 years ago to $975 million a year last year and it's going to increase by 20%. So it will cross billion dollar market. This is a over-the-counter medication. 
and it's going to cross billion dollar next year. So it's great. I think that's that's it. So thank, thank you, you, Sachin. Um, yeah, right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>